Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We are talking about the Malaika, and of course, this is one of the pillars of Iman. And our next talking point about the Malaika is that they inhabit and populate the heavens. As in Surah As Safat, Wama minna illa lahu maqamun ma'lum. And there is none amongst us except that he has a known place where he's supposed to be. Likewise, wa inna la nahnu safun. And verily we stand in rows, and verily we make tasbih. And in the hadith, The heavens have grown and they have the right to groan. There is not a space of four fingers in the heavens except there is an angel either standing or in the sajda or in the ruku'ah position. But when it comes to the malaika, there is so much that can actually be said. Is it wajib to have iman in everything? Well, the point is we have a minimum level which it is wajib to have iman in. And this minimum level beneath which you are an outright kafir, because if you do not have this level, and you have rejected the Malaika, it means you have rejected what Allah Jalla wa ala has informed us of in the Quran. And that means you have rejected the whole Quran, and that means you are a kafir. So, what is this minimum level? Well, the minimum level is to have Iman that the Malaika exist. Not just that, but it is to have Iman that these Malaika are the servants of Allah Jalla wa ala, and they are not his daughters, and they are not to be worshipped. This is the minimum wajib which every person who calls himself a mu'min needs to have. And this is speaking on a general level. As for speaking on a more detailed level, then it is wajib to have iman to acknowledge everything written about the malaika in the Qur'an and in the authentic sunnah without rejecting it. So any information about the malaika that comes to you from the Qur'an that perhaps you come across or an ayah that you read, it is wajib for you to accept it. So, it might be that a person has Iman in the Malaika, but he has never heard of this Malak called Jibreel. And then he, let us say, reads the Qur'an, and he comes across the name of Jibreel, which is mentioned in the Qur'an. So now, at that point, when he comes across this name, and he now knows that there is a Malak, or an angel called Jibreel, it is wajib for him to have Iman that there is this Malak called Jibreel. So if now he rejects Jibreel, then it is as if he has rejected all of the Malaika. Just like rejecting one prophet is like rejecting all of the prophets. Rejecting one scripture of Allah is like rejecting the whole of the scriptures. And the same thing goes for Mikal and Israfil. As for their duties, then the more you know the better, but it is not wajib on every single person to know that the duty of Mikal is that he is in charge of the rain and crop growth that Israfil is in charge of blowing the trumpet. No, the minimum wajib is just to have Iman generally that the Malaika exist and that they are servants of Allah. But whatever knowledge comes your way from the Quran or authentic Sunnah about the Malaika, then it is wajib upon you to have Iman in it. And so actually from this we can say that your Iman depends on the knowledge. So the more knowledge you have of the Malaika, the more Iman you will have. And so therefore, because people don't have equal knowledge, they do not have equal Iman. And this is a vital point about Iman, is that your Iman follows your knowledge. The more knowledge you have, the more Iman you have. So, the more knowledge you have of Allah Jalla wa ala, the greater your Iman in Allah. So, what are the qualities that we know of the Malaika? Well, first of all, they are honoured servants of Allah, as in Surah Al-Anbiya, بَلْ عِبَادٌ مُكْرَمُونَ Nay, they are honoured servants. We also know from them, لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون. They do not disobey Allah in what He orders them with, and they do what they are ordered. And they are not His daughters. They are not related to Allah جل وعلا as the مشركون would think. Allah جل وعلا says in Surah Safat: وجعلوا بينه وبين الجنة نسبا ولقد علمت الجنة إنهم لا محضرون. And they made between Allah and the Jinna. A nasab, which is a family relation, but the jinnah know that they are going to be brought forth. Now, jinnah sounds like jinn, but one of the tafsir says that the word jinnah refers to the malaika, 
because these root letters, Jim, Noon, Noon, have this idea of something being covered up, so you're unable to see them. And the Malaika certainly are, if you like, covered up, your eyes cannot detect them. Similarly, وَجَعَلُوا الْمَلَائِكَةَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ إِنَاثَةً أَشَّهِدُوا خَلْقَهُمْ سَتُكْتَبُ شَهَادَتُهُمْ وَيُسْأَلُونَ And they made the Malaika, who are the servants of Allah, into females. Did they witness their creation, meaning the creation of the Malaika? Their testimony is going to be written down and they will be questioned. Likewise, we know that the Malaika are not worthy of worship. وَيَوْمَ يَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يَقُولُوا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ أَهَّاؤُلَاءِ إِيَّاكُمْ كَانُوا يَعْبُدُونَ قَالُوا سُبْحَانَكَ أَنْتَ وَلِيُّنَا مِنْ دُونِهِمْ بَلْ كَانُوا يَعْبُدُونَ الْجِنَّ أَكْفَرُهُمْ بِهِمْ مُؤْمِنُونَ And the day when he will gather them all together and he will say to the Malaika Are these the ones who are worshipping you? The Malaika will say Subhan be to you May you be removed from any imperfection. You are our master, not they. But rather they were worshipping the jinn. Most of them had iman in them. Okay, here's a question. Does having iman in the malaika have an effect on the way you live your life? Well, the answer is yes, because if you know that there are malaika who are writing down your deeds, then this will have an effect on how you behave. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, Kiraman katibin ya'lamuna ma taf'alun They are honored and they are writing down They know what you do He's talking about the malaika here They are honored and they are writing down your deed They know what you are doing So even if you are in privacy Where you think no one else can see you And you can do whatever you want Well the malaika will always be with you Not only do they know what you are doing But they are writing it down Likewise, in Surah Qaf, ما يلفظ من قول إلا لديه رقيب عتيد. He does not even utter a word except with him. There is the one who is رقيب, observing, and عتيد, ready to write down. So if you have iman in these ayat, then it will have an effect on how you behave, as long as you're conscious of these ayat. Also, your iman in the malaika has an effect on your iman in the other pillars. Because Jibreel alayhi salam brings down the wahi, does he not? But the wahi is from the books of Allah. And to whom does the wahi reach? Well, it reaches the prophets. So that's another pillar of iman. So your iman in the malaika is linked to your iman in the books of Allah and your iman in the prophets. Likewise, Israfil is going to blow the trumpet and that's linked to your iman in the yawm al-akhir. Mikal is in charge of the crop growth and that is part of the Qadr because you will only receive what is written down for you to receive in terms of the Rizq so again it has a link to your Iman in Qadr and also when the child is in the belly and the soul is blown into it the Malak comes down and writes four things this is again part of your Qadr so you see Iman in the Malaika is not just Iman in the Malaika it is in fact Iman in the other pillars of Iman as well, which is why after having Iman in Allah, the second pillar of Iman which comes directly after Allah is the Iman in the Malaika. That's how vital Iman in the Malaika is. There is another matter spoken of, who is superior, the Malaika or humans? The opinion of Shaykh al-Islam is that the Malaika are superior in this world because they are made of light, a superior element and they are closer to Allah Jalla wa ala. but in the hereafter the humans will be superior to the Malaika because they will be closer to Allah Jalla wa ala in Jannah however this may seem like an interesting comparison but really nothing practical results from it and so there is no need for us to delve into these matters as they are not very important and they are not central to our Iman we need to be concerned with matters that are central to our Iman such as the pillars of Iman and the basic knowledge therein. The people of Bid'ah, they claim that there are no angels. Rather, all this angel business is simply the force of good. So it's a force, it's not a person. Whereas we say no, angels are personal beings, they are a person. Not a human person, but a person nevertheless. And this falsehood of theirs can easily be refuted where Allah Jalla wa ala, for example, says about the Malaika 
يُسَبِّحُونَ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ لَا يَفْتُرُونَ They are making tasbih by night time and by day time and they do not wane. This is clearly not a description of a force, rather of a person. Okay, let's move on to the next pillar, which is the Iman in the Anbiya, the Prophets. First of all, let us define this word. You could call it an nabi with a Shadda on the Ya. So it comes from the word an nabwa which means a raised place. And this is because the Prophets are raised above other people. They have a higher status. Or it could be pronounced an nabi with a Hamza at the end and no Shadda on the Ya. And that would come from Naba, which means news. So that would mean that the Nabi is somebody who is informed. As for Ar-Rasul, that simply means messenger, one who is sent. But then comes the famous issue and dispute. Is a prophet and messenger the same thing or are they different? Some scholars have said they are the same people. A Nabi is a prophet, a prophet is a Nabi. Just two words describing the same person. However, if we look at the text and analyze it, we find that there has to be a difference between a prophet and a messenger. So in Surah Al-Hajj, Ayah 52, Allah wa ala tells us, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ إِلَّا إِذَا تَمَنَّا أَلْقَ الشَّيْطَانُ فِي أُمْنِيَتِهِ فَيَنْسَخُ اللَّهُ مَا يُلْقِ الشَّيْطَانُ ثُمَّ يُحْكِمُ اللَّهُ آيَاتِهِ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ Never did we send a messenger nor a prophet before you, O Muhammad But when he did recite the revelation, or he narrated or he spoke, the shaytan threw some falsehood in his speech. But Allah abolishes that which the shaytan threw in, the speech of the prophet, and then he establishes his revelation. And Allah is the no otherwise. So the shahid from the ayah is that Allah says, We never sent before you a messenger nor a prophet. So that has to mean that they are two different things. So is a prophet sent to people? Well, we know from the hadith in the sahih that there will be some prophets who come with a large gathering, some with a few people, and there will be a prophet who will come with nobody. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean he was not sent to anyone to preach the message? Or does that mean that he was sent... But nobody answered his call. It could carry both meanings. However, let us take a look at another hadith in Sahih Muslim. مَا مِن نَبِيٍ مِنَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ إِلَّا وَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ مِنَ الْآيَاتِ مَا عَلَى مِثْلِهِ آمَنَ الْبَشَرِ وَكَانَ الَّذِي أُوْتِيتُهُ وَحْيًا أُوْحِيَ إِلَيَّ فَأَرْجُ أَنْ أَكُونَ أَكْثَرَهُمْ تَبَعًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ There was no prophet from the prophet except that he was given some signs upon which the people believed or accepted his message. But what I have been given is the wahi, is the revelation, meaning the Qur'an, which Allah has revealed to me, so I hope that I will have the most followers out of all the prophets on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So it appears to us from this hadith in Sahih Muslim that every prophet was given a sign which the people followed. So every prophet had some sort of followers. So as for the previous hadith then, which talks about the Prophet coming with no followers, then it may well mean that this Prophet was not actually sent to anybody. And that is why he did not have any followers, because if a Prophet was sent to some people, he would have had some followers. And also, there is a hadith in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, which says that the number of Prophets have been 124,000, and the number of Messengers have been 314. If that hadith is authentic, then that would be clear-cut evidence that there is a difference. But it appears that there is a difference, even if we do not take that hadith, because the ayah in Surah Al-Hajj is enough of an evidence. So the question now becomes, what is the difference between a prophet and a messenger? Well, one opinion held by many scholars is that a Nabi is not ordered to deliver the message to others, whereas a Rasul, a messenger, is ordered to deliver the message. So that's the difference. The commonality is that they are both inspired with the Sharia, with the Tawheed, and to worship Allah Jalla wa Ala. They're both inspired in that way. So that's the commonality. But the difference is one is ordered to deliver the message, the other one is not. Another opinion held by Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah is that both messengers and prophets are sent to the people to deliver the message, as in Surah Al Hajj. 
وما أرسلنا من قبلك من رسول ولا نبي إلا إذا تمنى الآية We did not send before you any messenger nor prophet except that when he recited up to the end of the ayah. So this opinion says they are both sent. They are both inspired with the sharia, whatever the sharia of that time is, but they are also sent as well. So where's the difference? The difference is, they say, a messenger is sent to a people who are largely going to disagree with him. So these people are largely upon shirk, such as what happened with Nuh salam, with the last prophet salam, and so on. Whereas with a Nabi, a prophet, he is sent to a people who are largely going to agree with him. So he is very much like a scholar giving a lecture to the Muslims. His students, the Muslims, are largely going to agree with him because they are upon Tawheed. But the scholar serves to educate and to reinforce what they know. And this is the better opinion. It is a balanced one. The next talking point is that these prophets and messengers, are they all the same in virtue? Well, the answer is no. We have clear-cut evidences for this. A clear one in the Quran, تِلْكَ الرُّسُلُ فَضَّلْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ Those messengers, we preferred some over others. مِنْهُمْ مَنْ كَلَّمَ اللَّهُ وَرَفَعَ بَعْضَهُمْ دَرَجَاتٍ From them are those to whom Allah spoke and He raised some in grades. The first of the prophets, Adam alayhi salam, the last of them, Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, the first of messengers, Nuh, and the last of them, Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Adam alayhi salam was a prophet who was spoken to, as in the hadith, Adam, Nabiyun mukallam. Adam is a prophet spoken to. We know about five particular prophets and messengers who are the Ulul Azam, the people of firm will. These people who could withstand much pressure and much opposition. The Prophet is told in the Quran, Fasbir kama sabara ulul azmi min al rusul. So be patient, just like the ulul azm, the people of firm will from the messengers kept patient. Who are these ulul azm then? Well, one opinion says every messenger was from the ulul azm, as in Fasbir kama sabara ulul azmi min al rusul. Be patient, just like. Those of the Ulul Azam from the messengers kept patient. So they say the Ulul Azam are all the messengers. Another opinion says these are the 18 messengers mentioned in Surah Al An'am. And the third opinion, the better one, says that these are five mentioned in Surah Al Ahzab and Surah Al Shura. Shara ala kum min al dini ma wa sabihi nuhum wa ladi awhina ilayk wa ma wa sayna bihi Ibrahim wa Musa wa Isa. أن أقيم الدين ولا تتفرق في كبر على المشركين ما تدعوهم إليه الله يجتبي إليه من يشاء ويهدي إليه من ينيب. In this ayah of Surah Ash-Shura, number thirteen, five messengers are mentioned. He says we have ordained for you. That's the first messenger, just like what we ordained for Nuh عليه السلام. And that which we have inspired you, and that which we ordered Ibrahim and Musa and Isa to establish the deen and to be not divided. So if we count them, there are five now in total. And also from the hadith of the Ash-Shafa'atul Uthma, the people are going to go to these five messengers, apart from Adam alayhi salam. Our next talking point, Allah Jalla wa ala gives every prophet signs. And he has to do that, of course, because otherwise any person can claim to be a prophet, yet he is just a charlatan. So these signs are called ayat, or they can also be called baraheen, meaning evidences. As for the word mu'ajiza, which means miracle, then this is a word that the Qur'an does not use with relation to the prophets and messengers. The word mu'ajiza means to render someone incapable, but who is it rendering incapable? Is it rendering the whole of mankind incapable of reproducing the like thereof? Or is it just rendering the people to whom the messengers were sent incapable? Or is it rendering jinn and mankind incapable? Or jinn, mankind and malaika? So these are various questions. And so we don't find in the text of the Quran this word being used. As for the Quran, then we have spoken about this before that this renders jinn and mankind incapable to reproduce the like thereof. And we have the clear-cut ayah in Surah Al-Isra. So the word Burhan 
is a clear evidence, as clear as the sunlight, that this person is a prophet or a messenger. So for example, with the Musa alayhi salam, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, Fi tis'i ayatin ila fir'awna wa qawmi. Nine signs to Fir'aun and his people. Also, فَذَانِكَ بُرْحَنَانِ مِنْ رَبِّكْ So these two are two burhan, clear-cut evidences from your Rabb. The next talking point is to ask the question, what does having Iman in the Prophets and Messengers actually entail? Well, what you have to affirm is that Allah has sent these messengers and prophets and that they were the best of mankind in their time and that Allah aided them with signs so ayat and barahin, and this showed people that these are truthful men. This is the basic iman. And then we can talk on a general level. We believe generally in the messengers and prophets. You don't have to know the names of every messenger and prophet, but you must believe in a general sense that Allah has sent these messengers and prophets to deliver the deen to the people. As for if authentically you come to know by a name of a prophet from authentic a hadith or Quran, then it is obligatory upon you to have Iman in that. So it runs parallel to the Iman in the Malaika. You can have your Iman on a general level and then on a much more detailed level when it comes to names and particular stories of what the prophets did. And of course, for this particular Ummah, Having a general Iman in the Prophet is not good enough because then you would be no different to the Christians and Jews. Rather, you need to have Iman in one particular Prophet by way of name. That is, of course, Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Qurashi alayhi salatu wasalam. And so it is wajib for this particular Ummah not just to have Iman in this Prophet by way of name, but also it is wajib to have Iman that he is the last of the messengers and Prophets. This is absolutely vital. Otherwise, we do have people who call themselves Muslims, but they believe in a prophet after this last prophet. Allah Jalla wa Ala tells us in Surah Al-Ahzab, وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ But rather, he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. Okay, the next point to note is that whoever disbelieves or belies one prophet or messenger has belied all of them. And we have clear evidence for this. In the Quran, كَذَّبَتْ قَوْمُ نُوحٍ الْمُرْسَلِينَ The people of Nuh belied the messengers. Note the plural. Despite the fact that they only belied one messenger, and that was Nuh alayhi salam, because only he was sent to them. إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ نُوحٌ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ When their brother Nuh said, will you not have taqwa? So we find only he was sent to them. But the ruling is they belied every single messenger. And why is this? Because the deen of all the prophets is the same. The prophets are brothers from the same father. That means to say that their deen is one and the same, but their detailed law system is diverse. Now let us talk about the next pillar of Iman, which the Shaykh mentioned. And the books sent down to the messengers. So the first point to note is that the book of Allah Jalla wa Ala is his wahi, his revelation to the messengers. It could be that he reveals this directly to a messenger, or it could also be that he reveals it via an angel. In Surah Al-Shura, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشِرٍ أَنْ يُكَلِّمَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا وَحْيًا أَوْ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حجاب أَوْ يُرْسِلَ رَسُولًا فَيُوحِيَ بِإِذْنِهِ مَا يَشَاءُ it is not for any man that Allah should speak to him except by way of revelation, the wahi, or speak to him directly from behind a hijab, or that he sends a messenger, meaning an angel, and so he reveals to him whatever he wills. So the wahi can be translated to inspiration, which a prophet can experience. This can also be via a dream, but it does not have to be. Or it could be just a direct speech as Musa salam, spoke to Allah Jalla wa Ala, but it was behind a veil. So Allah was not seen. And it can also be that an angel brings down the wahi or the information which must be conveyed to the messenger. And that is how the Quran was conveyed to the messenger. The next discussion point is that these books which Allah has sent down to the messengers, they can speak about different topics. 
So you can have topics about preaching and, if you like, heart softeners. But on the other hand, you can also have laws and regulations. This is halal, this is haram, that sort of thing. And other topics can also be stories of the past so that people can take admonition. There can also be prophecies. So that is now talking about the future. But what all the books have in common is to order people to worship Allah Jalla wa ala and to make kufr in ta'ahut, which is anything worshipped besides Allah or anything even obeyed or followed besides Allah or if you like in competition with Allah. And another commonality are the six pillars of Iman. Every prophet has taught these because these pillars in principle do not change. It doesn't matter where or when you're living. Okay, what does having Iman in the books actually entail? Well, we say like we have said with the Malaika and with the Prophets, you have a general level and then you have a specific level. So as for the general level, then you believe, you have Iman, you acknowledge with certainty that Allah has sent down scriptures to the Prophets and Messengers to guide the people. This is the minimum wajib on a general level. Again, it is not wajib to know the names of every single scripture. And then we can have a detailed level, which is that if a name of a book comes your way by way of authentic evidence, then yes, it is wajib upon you to accept it and not to reject it. So if you are told that Isa salam was given the Injil, now Injil is a particular name, so now it is wajib upon you to have Iman in this. However, in particular for this Ummah, we say, similar to what we said about the Prophets, there is a particular scripture that you must know by way of name. Of course, we are talking about the Qur'an, and what does that entail? Well, it is wajib then to have Iman that the Qur'an is the speech of Allah, not the speech of man. And we emphasize the word speech, which is kalam in Arabic. Secondly, to have Iman that the Qur'an abrogates anything contrary to it from the previous scriptures. So here we are talking about the laws. As for news items, they cannot be abrogated because a news item is a news item. It is not a law such that it can never be abrogated. So any news item of the Qur'an must be believed in with certainty. Allah Jalla wa ala describes the Qur'an as مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَمُهَيْمِنًا عَلَيْهِ Testifying to the truth of the books before it and a muhaymin over the other books. A muhaymin is one who has authority and guards that thing which he has authority over. Much like a bird guards its eggs and its young hatchling. It is a muhaymin over it. So it has obviously authority over it and it guards it, it watches over it. And this is the Qur'an with regard to the other scriptures. So you see that it has the authority. Therefore, nothing from the previous scriptures is allowed to take precedence over the Qur'an in terms of the laws. At this point, we ask a question. Is the suhuf of Musa the same as the Torah? Because the Qur'an speaks about the Torah, but it also speaks about suhuf of Musa, the scriptures of Musa. And we have a difference of opinion here. So some scholars say that they are the same thing. And the other opinion is that they are different things. Now in Surah Al-A'raf, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَكَتَبْنَا لَهُ فِي الْأَلْوَاحِ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ مَوْعِذَةً وَتَفْصِيلًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ And we wrote for him, meaning for Musa, in the alwah, which are the tablets, we wrote every type of preaching and admonition and a detail for everything. But when it comes to the Torah, then we also know that Allah Jalla wa ala wrote the Torah with his hand. We know that from the Hadith. This is why some scholars have said that they are the same thing. Both are written. Others may argue that yes, both are written, but the Torah is also a wahi, a revelation, whereas the suhuf, the scriptures, are simply a piece of writing on a tablet and not something that the angel recites to the Prophet. And Allah Jalla wa ala knows best. Okay, so we have spoken about Allah Jalla wa ala, His Malaika, the books, and the Prophets. We have also spoken about the Qadr. So these are five. We have yet to speak about the sixth pillar, which is the Al Yawmul Akhir, the final day. That is coming up in a bit more detail with regards to the events of the Yawm Al Qiyamah and then the Jannah and Jahannam. So let us delay the discussion until we reach the text. However, at this point, it is worth noting that whereas for the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, these are the six pillars of Iman, the Ahlul Bid'ah also have their pillars or their fundamental beliefs in accordance with their Madhab. So with the Mu'tazila, for example, 
They have five usul, five fundamentals, and they are as follows. Number one, al-tawheed. Number two, al-adl, which is justice. Number three, al-wa'ad wal-wa'id, promise of goodness, meaning jannah, and wa'id, which is a warning or a threat against the punishment. Number four is al-manzila bain al-manzilatayn, status between the two statuses, meaning to say being neither a kafir nor a mu'min, so in between. And this is the one who commits major sins. And asl number five is the al-amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar, enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. The rafidah have their usul, four of them. Number one, al-tawheed. Number two is al-adl. Number three is al-nubuwa, prophethood. And number four is al-imama, this idea of being the imam. And they are, of course, fascinated and infatuated with these imams of theirs. Then the Shaykh goes on to say, وَنُسَمِّي أَهْلَ قِبْلَتِنَا مُسْلِمِينَ مُؤْمِنِينَ مَا دَامُوا بِمَا جَاءَ بِهِ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ مُعْتَرِفِينَ وَلَهُ بِكُلِّ مَا قَالَ وَأَخْبَرَ مُصَدِّقِينَ And we name the people of our Qibla as Muslimin and Mu'mineen as long as they acknowledge everything which the Prophet ﷺ came with and they believe or they affirm everything which he ﷺ has informed us of. In Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ أَكَلَ ذَبِيحَتَنَا وَاسْتَقْبَلَ قِبْلَتَنَا لَهُ مَا لَنَا وَعَلَيْهِ مَا عَلَيْنَا Whoever eats our sacrificed meat and he faces our qibla, our direction, meaning the Kaaba, then he has the rights which we have, and against him are the rights which are against us. So he has the rights, but he also has the same responsibilities as any other Muslim. So in the hadith, the Prophet mentions eating of the sacrificed meat and facing the qibla. These are two actions which distinguish the Muslims from the rest. The Shaykh mentions Qibla because only the Muslims face the Kaaba. No other person of any other deen faces the Kaaba in their acts of ibadah. So anyone who faces the Kaaba in his salah, we call him Muslim Mu'min. Now that is the asl unless we have any evidence otherwise that takes them out of Islam. The Shaykh goes on to say and gives a vital condition as long as they acknowledge everything that the Prophet brought and they believe everything that he informed us of. So let's take some issues from this. The first talking point is where he says the people of the Qibla. This pertains to the Kaaba, and the hadith from Al-Bukhari which we have quoted proves this point. Okay, so these people of the Qibla, does this include all these people of Bid'ah as well? The Prophet ﷺ spoke about this Ummah splitting up into 73 groups, all of them in the fire except one. The answer is yes, it includes all of these groups people of the Sunnah and people of the Bid'ah because they all face the Kaaba in their Salah. It also includes the Munafiqoon as well because the Munafiqoon would pray with the Muslims during the time of the Prophet and they would be facing the Kaaba and the Prophet ﷺ did not declare them to be non-Muslims. We know internally they were Kuffar, yes, but outwardly the Prophet did not declare them to be Kuffar. The next point is an interesting one. He says Muslimin Mu'minin. So from this it appears that He's telling us that Muslim and Mu'min is the same thing, so Islam and Iman therefore will be the same thing. However, that is not necessarily the case. When mentioned separately, Islam is Iman and Iman is Islam. That is fine, but when mentioned together, then there is a difference. Your Islam is your physical actions that you perform, and your Iman are your internal convictions. And this is made clear from the hadith of Jibreel who asked the Prophet about Islam and then he asked him about Iman and you'll notice the Prophet gave different answers. For Islam, he gave basically the pillars of Islam, which are actions. And for your Iman, he gave your internal convictions, what you believe, the six pillars of Iman. These are not physical actions. These are your beliefs or if you like, your internal convictions. And also in Surah Al-Hujurat, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ The Arab, the nomadic Arab, they say that we have Iman. Tell them you do not have Iman, but rather you should say that you have become Muslim, but Iman has not yet entered your hearts. And this is because the Arab were performing actions of Islam. But as for their internal conviction, they did not have that yet. 
So in other words, they physically submitted in terms of physically performing the salah and so on. That doesn't mean in your heart you have a firm conviction. Our next talking point is that the Shaykh says as long as they acknowledge what the Prophet brought. So that is to say that even if a person is facing a qibla in his salah, but he rejects the message of the Prophet, then we cannot say that he is a Muslim nor a Mu'min. Here, however, we need to distinguish between what is al-jahad, which means to reject something, and al-ta'wil, which is to interpret something. So whoever brazenly rejects what the Prophet has brought, then he is a kafir, meaning to say something in the Qur'an or authentically in the Sunnah, which cannot be interpreted one way or the other. There's just a single linear interpretation and he just brazenly rejects that. Then this is kufr. So what we are saying is that those evidences which leave us no scope for interpretation and they are simply linear in their meaning, then you are not allowed to reject this. However, other evidences could leave some room or some scope for interpretation one way or the other. So for example, when it comes to the attributes of Allah Jalla wa ala, Many people may not reject them outright, but they will interpret it in a different way. For the hand of Allah, they would interpret it to mean his power or his ni'mah. Now, these people are not kuffar because they haven't rejected the text. They interpreted it in the wrong manner. Because you see, the difference is they haven't actually rejected anything. They've accepted the text as it is. So the fundamental text itself, they've accepted it. So they haven't rejected anything. It's just that... They have interpreted the text in a different manner, in a wrong manner, in a misguided manner. And that is not kufr. Of course, when somebody makes a ta'wil in a bid'ah type of fashion, then what saves him from becoming a kafir is that he has some backing in the Arabic language for his ta'wil. So in the Arabic language, there is some backing to say that the hand can mean power. Because verily, in the Arabic language, hand can mean power. So it is this backing in the Arabic language which prevents them from becoming kuffar. As for if you interpret the text in a misguided manner without any backing whatsoever from the Arabic language, then this is tantamount to actually outright and brazenly rejecting it. So anyone who says, for example, that khamr is halal, and then he claims, no, that this is his ta'wil, would we accept it? Well, we would say, what's your backing for this ta'wil? You cannot just claim a ta'wil, an interpretation, you have to have some sort of backing for this ta'wil. So if you don't have a backing for your ta'wil, then this becomes not ta'wil anymore, it basically becomes al-jahad, which is to reject. Or if somebody says that sodomy is halal, and then he claims that he's saying this because of ta'wil, we ask him, what is your backing for this ta'wil? Because then any kafir can make any kufr claim and then defend himself under the veil of ta'wil. Oh, I'm just making ta'wil. No, the ta'wil needs to have a backing. In the Arabic language. Okay, now let us take a few review questions. Question number one. What is the minimum belief in the mala'ika? Question two. Explain how beliefs in the various mala'ika affects you and why is it even important? After all, the mala'ika are another world, they're doing what they're doing and humans are doing what humans are doing. How does it all affect you? And why is it important? Question number three. Are prophets and messengers the same thing? Explain the answer. Question four. What is the difference between jahad and ta'wil? Ta 